<laughs> Maybe another round of applause as well. I think a lot of folks, you know, obviously we're applauding towards the end with the headset on, but now that we can all hear, Rita, congratulations. Maybe just uh, to begin with, and, and sorry, is this is this Ke Kevin, Kevin as well? This is Kevin, Kevin, yeah, please, come on Kevin. Up, Kevin. Come on. <laughs> Kevin Quain, composer of the film. <laughs> um, maybe just to begin oh, with, there are a couple of instances in the film where you talk about this being something that you wanted to do for twenty years. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering what was the catalyst to finally be like, okay, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Now it's finally got to happen. Uh, so, um, you know, I planted trees for 10 years and after that I became a documentarian and a, a conflict photographer. And when I was working in conflict zones, people used to ask me what prepared me for that work. And one of the things I told them was tree planting in Canada which surprised them because tree planting didn't sound all that hard to them. And actually at one point my, my agent in New York actually said, you should take this tree planting thing off your CV because it looks so trivial compared to your other accomplishments. And I just thought, you know, one day I want to make a project about this that will really try and give an immersive experience about what tree planting is like. And I think I've come some distance to that, but but the truth is that tree planting is a lot harder than it looks, and even in this film. But uh, the, the catalyst really was in 2015, I had just come back from a trip. I'd spent a couple of months living in Hebron and Palestine. It's a very uh, rough place. And uh, I had, was having a big show about a project I'd done in Afghanistan. And I, I was coming to the end of my sort of own emotional tolerance for the kind of work I was doing and I felt I needed to do something that that had the potential of being uplifting and I remembered that tree planting had offered me this kind of strength and I wondered you know is that just how I remember it will I go back and be disappointed but I had to find out and so I I went back to see if it could it could sort of bring me back and give me things that I had maybe lost grasp of and so and it and it did it did deliver for me and so i'm sure obviously the the, the photos were uh, a, a natural undertaking but how did you decide that you needed to go beyond the the, the still image documentation and and really kind of create this 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 moving portrait of this community uh, so yeah, I've been a still I've been a still photographer a lot longer than uh, a filmmaker. I made a short film in uh, 2013, and Darby McInnes, who edited Forest for the Trees, who's sitting over here, uh, Darby uh, also edited. Yay, Darby! Um, it was 15 months of editing, by the way. Um, Darby had edited my short film uh, about bomb shelters in uh, in Israel, and so I. Well, well, basically, it's the technology. The, the moment that stills cameras started having video in them, stills photographers suddenly, you're out there in the field, and because it's in the device that you're carrying, you're naturally going to start segueing into making film. And so a lot of still photographers have started making films, and, I, and we have a distinct way of working. Like, this is very much a photographer's film. And, uh, and then of course there's the audio as well. And that's like a whole other, you know, whole other really exciting thing. Like it adds all these incredible layers and control because now suddenly, you know, if someone goes to an art gallery, you don't know how long they're gonna look at your pictures and you make a film and you have so much control over what people are looking at and what they're listening to. Yeah, I mean, obviously, once you're making a, a moving image work, uh, that tends to also involve sound, and then, uh, you know, you bring music into it, and so I'm curious about your collaboration with Kevin and how that came about. Yeah, so, uh, well, I'll, I, can I start? I, I always do. <laughs> um, so, first of all, it was an amazing experience. Like, um, the first time I worked with sound on my short film, I had a little session with a friend who's a sound technician, and he he set me enough uh, up enough just to make sure that what I got worked. You know, like I always like like rather than trying to get. Uh, anyways, that's 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 aside. But so I'm not a sound person. This is the point. I'm a visual person, and uh, 
So working with sound intimidates me and working with the music was kind of scary for me. And, but Kevin and I have been friends since we were 18. We met in an English class at the University of Toronto. And uh, we're, we're this tall, we're this tall. And, uh, and I'd been following his career for many years and we'd stayed friends over the years, sort of on and off. And, uh, you know, so I asked him to work on this film with me because I, I'm such an admirer of his music and people who have seen the, and listened to the score of the film, uh, most of you, or some of you have seen Kevin perform and uh, you have to go listen to the songs that he is, that he has sings and composes. Kevin Quain, you know, follow him on YouTube, by the way. Follow Kevin on YouTube. And uh, anyways, I need, I, I need the numbers. He need, you know what? On it's YouTube, old. if you don't have a thousand uh, members, you can't make any money. So seriously, follow Kevin Quinn on YouTube and tell oh, yeah, your sister. All the folk singers are laughing at me. <laughs> but, you know, every road trip I went on, like I was in Iraq with... Kevin Quain CDs, like everywhere I've been around the world, I'm blasting Kevin Quain CDs on whatever, you know, vehicle I'm driving around whatever roads around the world. And, uh, and when I was afraid of not being able to communicate my needs, like Kevin said to me, you know, you don't always have the language for it, but my job is to help you find that and help you get what you want. And he turned it into this unbelievable experience and like, on, like, like so many times he just delivered me scores that I just like made me so happy I cried. I, he might not have such a nice ex memory of the experience. It was, good. <laughs> it, was, it was good. I think we, we uh, yeah, I think we had a good idea of like what the idea of it was before we started making sounds, but we had an idea of what it might feel like and it was going to bring together the sort of organic w w world of nature and but also the industrial world and technology and uh, I think we even said can I say this we didn't want it to sound we knew what we didn't want it to sound like we don't want it to sound well, was maybe my term I don't want it to sound too CBC you know like tastefully played guitars and you know the sound of loons or whatever not picking on CBC but but it, it was going to be something more in your face and something that was going to reflect the the grittiness of that world and um yeah and not not have this kind of polite view of nature you know it's like nature is terrifying i mean it is to me i've never even been camping you know i get itchy sometimes looking at this film <laughs> it's, it's the bugs but uh, so yeah that was i think we had we had a, an idea of it in our heads and i think it came out something close to what we what we were imagining and uh, had great uh Great help from uh, Burt Carroll. You're hearing pedal steel all the way through that, and that's that's the amazing Burt Carroll, beautiful, beautiful player. Uh, Andrew Downing, a great uh, composer too, and a great uh, cellist. So we hear a fair bit of him. Um, Michelle's song at the end, Mary Margaret O'Hara, we've sprinkled in there, um, and she's magic. Um, so yeah, we got to, we got to play with a lot of a lot of different kinds of sounds, um, and have that not have it be too rootsy and organic, but have some scary mm -hmm. bleeps and squawks mm, yeah. did we have some questions in the audience while we're maybe waiting for someone to throw up a hand i should note that we do have copies of the book for sale at our merch stand uh which will remain open for a little while yet and also the bar i think will be open until at least 11 p.m um so That's a wave rather, is that a wave or a question? I just saw someone ah, th There we go. And yeah, I mean, so the so for the book, if any of you are interested in the book, there are some copies for sale there. But uh, yeah. this project, you know, it's a film, it's a book, it's large scale fine art photographs. I mean, the way that I approached this was really uh, intermixing these three medium and people who get to experience actually all three parts. It's really, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. And there's a real uh, interweaving of the concept and the design of the book and of the film. And in fact, when Darby and I were editing the film, we had our desks side by side and I was designing the book at the same time. I should mention that there are some photos at the Stephen Vulgar Gallery at the moment as well. 
Yeah, um, and the, yeah, the Stephen Bulger Gallery is doing like a special uh, two-week exhibition in their front room of the like super giant, uh, these photographs that you see on screen, you can actually see these fine art prints and they're really uh, magical to see. Sorry, please go ahead. Um, how soon are we for this whole process being automated by machines versus humans? Yeah, it's a great a great question, and tree planting is really far away from being automated. Um, in fact, it probably never will be, uh, which is one of the things. Like logging has been so mechanized, and in fact, the reason tree planting exists is because of mechanization. And when I came back to tree planting, you know, 30 years later, it's being done exactly the same way. And the reason is the difficulty of the terrain. So decisions have to be made and uh, you have to dig under and get through to where the soil is. And if you're just like randomly dropping things from the sky, they're going to land on rocks or in rivers or lakes. And, uh, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of uh, forestry experts. I have a forestry consultant on my film. So uh, no one I... Uh, Okay, if you're in farmer's fields, that's a really different thing. There are like uh, tree plantations in Texas where it's really flat and it looks like a farmer's field and that's, that's mechanized, but that's a totally different thing, so. Any other questions in the audience? Uh, I think I see your hand over there. Yeah, we'll get you the mic. Do we have any tree planters here with us at the screening? And if so, are they are they going back next year? So yeah, sorry. This is usually the first one of the first things we ask. But how many tree planters in the audience? Some of them have gone drinking somewhere. Some are still here. Um, and how many people are related to tree planters? Yeah, a lot, a lot, yeah. Um, actually, picking up on the previous question, I was curious about the relationship between uh, the logging companies and then the people that are organizing the, the planting. What, what exactly is that relationship? How are those mm -hmm. organizations connected, if at all? Uh, okay, so the relationship between the logging companies and the tree planting contractors is something that's uh, pretty... Uh, it, uh, unique to Canada and that's partly why this whole tree planting subculture exists because in Canada the land is owned by the government it's crown land in the United States the land that's being logged and planted is owned by the logging companies themselves so up in Canada uh, and actually originally in the west coast of the US as well in the 70s when mechanization uh, you know uh, explodes in the technology changes radically and suddenly the need for more tree planting becomes uh, urgent. Uh, a group of young people from Western, mostly from Western Canada and USA, they're mountaineers, they're alpine ski racers. They get this idea that they could plant more trees than loggers do by treating planting like uh, a sport. And so they invent this concept of like sport uh, tree planting. And they, the first thing they do is they tailor make the shovels, they make the handle shorter, they change the blades, they build different bags for their putting around their waist, and they build their camps in the middle of the cut block. But they had put these contracts out. So the Canadian government in, I think it's around 1970, early 70s, says, okay, we're going to commit to planting 10 times more trees. They've recently done it with, you know, they're saying they're going to plant all these billions more trees. So we're in another sort of turning point like that. But, um, but they don't know how they're going to do that and these tree planters or these young people see a window and no one has told them they can't bid contracts so they bid on these contracts and the logging companies are like what the hell like who are but they couldn't stop it and so they started taking these contracts and lo and behold they planted unbelievable amounts of trees that no one had ever seen or imagined before and that's still how it's done that's sad uh, that's really remarkable uh, did we have some more? Qu oh, I think I see a hand there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what's the percentage of survival of the trees? 
Uh, it, uh, you know, it depends on things like the climate and uh, sometimes there could be a forest fire like the same summer and the trees you planted are already gone. But uh, it's actually really, really high. Like it's in the it's in the 90 percentile and the uh, quality is very closely monitored and there are people who go back multiple times a year checking on the land making sure the trees are growing doing you know scientific assessments trying to figure out how to change and improve planting for the future so it's it's pretty it's pretty high i mean the real pro the big problem we have is that we cut too much and we use too much i mean our problem is that we use all this stuff and that's where the curtailment has to happen because you can't just keep cutting and replanting because of course it takes 80 years for trees to grow and much less time to cut them so um you know ma on a massive scale we have to assess our our consumption Just looking for I have a question. Uh, oh, um, go ahead. I'd like to know, as a storyteller, at what point did you know that you wanted to incorporate yourself into the story, or was that a decision that was made at the beginning, or was that a decision that was made in editing? Um, I I knew that I wanted the film to be about photography from the beginning because, uh, as as uh, um, as interested as I had become in trying to explain to people how difficult tree planting was, I also spent a lot of time, you know, as a professor of photography and teaching photography and talking about photography, trying to explain to people how hard photography is. And, and it seemed like the perfect kind of parallel analogy. So from the outset, I wanted the film to show that and to show the photography, I had to be in the film making photographs. And the first year I didn't have anybody else to take pictures. I ended up like, the, well, the, the cook uh, volunteered for a couple of days and, and uh, I taught him how to fly a drone and we got a little bit of footage of me flying, me working. And then after I brought some friends in to get more of that footage. So I was in there as part of the process of making the work and this, you know, the film, it's these three, main thrust it's like trees get planted and go in the ground one tree at a time you build a forest uh a film is being made one picture at a time just as long any long form documentary stills project is made and at the end of of it you have a film and the other thing is the theme of recovery that is you know a metaphor running all through it that you recover from addiction or even just in a more general sense you get through life and all your struggles one day at a time one thing at a time it's like really really simple in that way so so i was in it in the uh ad ad addiction story and in the filmmaking story and the tree planting story i collected tons of video of myself just in case and also so i would remember what was going on and i've always kept journals so they just were video journals and uh, much later in the editing process, I think I showed you an early cut and I was really struggling with was I going to be in it. And at one point we were working on a voiceover and it was, you know, it was, I mean, editing, making a film, it's brutal. Like I cried so much. It's, you cry when you're planting trees, you cry when you're making films, you know, you cry when you're making music, you know, we just all cry a lot. Um, we're pretty emotional people. Um, so I, I had, uh, created a voiceover with the help of my friend Sarah Martin and we use that to hold the pieces together and you know Darby of course is here through all of this and uh and then one weekend I you know we had all that in place and I thought you know I have myself saying absolutely everything I say in the voiceover I say on film and I knew how to find it. So I just like went and I found it all and Darby came in on Monday and I said, okay, Darby, I'm back in it and here's all the stuff. And he's like, okay, you made that decision over the weekend and, and off we went and it, it seemed to work. And then just the sort of scaffolding, we'd created the scaffolding and just fell together. Any more questions in the audience? I think we probably have time for a couple more. Uh, I think, okay, yeah. Thanks, all y'all, for uh, staying for this Q and A, <laughs> and for applauding us. Just curious, uh, when you were making the film, you talked about uh, wildlife in at night. Any close encounters? Uh, <laughs> um, not really. 
No, I mean, that's the, you know, you're afraid of wildlife a lot more often than you have actual encounters. There are encounters, you know, like every couple of years, a tree planter is killed by a bear. Um, and, uh, but, you know, when we were out shooting that night footage, we were blasting music on little uh, portable uh, sound boxes. So we're in there, we're blasting music, which presumably keeps any kind of wild animals from coming near you. But we were scared. Like I look at that scene, I think, well, we edited that. I, th I think I say, yeah, we're afraid about four times, right? But I'm thinking, yeah, that was true. And my crew and uh, none of the crew from there are here tonight, but uh, you know, they they considered, of course, I was the authority. I was the one who spent all this time out in the cup block and we're driving out that night. And they're like, so are you sure this like playing really loud music out in the cup block is going to protect us from wild animals? I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. And I'm thinking, I have no idea. No idea, but you know, we're going to, I want to get this shot. So we're going to go out there. <laughs> uh, any further questions in the audience? I have one actually, while well, maybe we're waiting for a final one from the, from the audience. Um, there's obviously a very particular culture uh, in the tree planting community. I'm wondering between your experiences that, that, you know, the decades that passed between, when you went back to the cut block, did you find that you very much recognized the culture? Did it, had it persisted? Had it changed in any ways? I mean, you do have that segment where there are two women talking about sort of how they feel like cowgirls and how women are, you know, now a, a really integral mm -hmm. um, part of that community. Is that something that had changed since your early experience or, or what was the sort of comparison? Um, yeah, that's, I mean, a good and big question. So let me think of what the highlights of that are in my own experience. I mean, after tree planting, I spent 20 years I think in pursuit of com more communities like that, you know, like I went to conflict zones, but I made stories about giant communities for the rest of my career. And so here I was coming back to this kind of my original massive community. And um, I didn't know how many women there were going to be. I, I, I didn't actually ask a lot of questions because I thought, well, I'm going to go. So, you know, I'm going to be out there. I don't even really want to know. Like the first tree planting contract I was on was me and 12 men and uh, our first contract was 21 days and we lived out in the middle of a clear cut uh, north of Prince George with no tents and uh, and I, we had no cook. All we ate, honest to God, for 21 days was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which by the way I still love so I don't know what that's about. And uh, so someone asked me yesterday about why I went tree planting and uh, as a young woman in the 80s in Toronto the only kind of jobs that I could get without a lot of skill were like waitressing or even were I couldn't even get waitressing jobs hostessing jobs jobs where they were telling me to wear nylons and makeup and things I didn't feel proud of myself for doing and and uh, I'd also worked at at a ski resort in Lake Louise and I showed up and I was a I was a good skier that's partly how I got involved in in tree planting and why I look at it as a sport because I was a very serious alpine ski racer and uh, I get to Lake Louise and they're like well you know we hired women once to work on the hill and it didn't work so you get to work in the cafeteria and and it it was so degrading and tree planting you know, I got, I was lucky to get a job tree planting. My sister got me my first tree planting job because someone on her ski team at Western University had a tree planting contract. And, uh, you know, I was being judged for my work. I mean, there's still sexism in tree planting and it's got its problems, but uh, I was able to respect myself uh, and be judged for how many trees I put in the ground. And actually being a, an artist is like that too. Like no one pays you for the hours you put in, you know? It's like you gotta make the work. You have to have something to show for your time. Did we maybe have one final question in the audience? I also just wanna thank Kevin Quain again for coming up here and for doing the score for my film. And uh, isn't it a magnificent score? Yeah, totally, totally makes it just like it blows me away every time. And Michelle Rumble, thank you for that beautiful, beautiful song that ends the film on exactly the right uplifting note. Like I wanted to make a project that um, 
when people left the at the end of the film that they felt better able to face whatever challenge was in their life at that moment than they did when they walked into the theater. I think you've very much done that. Um, well, maybe if there's if there's not one final question, we'll we'll end it on that note of thanks. Uh, thank you to Rita and to Kevin and to you for for being with us, and uh, we hope you're able to see uh, a few more films over the course of the weekend. Thank you.